Okay, welcome back. Uh, our next panel is a terrific panel on financial disclosure and accounting fraud, which is always a really key issue and an important issue at the SEC. And let me start by introducing our moderator, Steve Richards, who is a senior managing director at Ankara. Uh, he brings a lot of unique experience to the table here. He previously served as an advisor to the PCAOB, um, the director of enforcement there and investigations, as well as an advisor to its chairman, but also as a former assistant chief accountant in the SEC's division of enforcement. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us, Bruce. Uh, also, uh, very pleased to be joined by Claudius Modesti, who is now a partner at Aiken Gump, but he also has a remarkable range of experience. He started his career as an attorney in the SEC's enforcement division, then went on to become a trial attorney in the DOJ's fraud section and a U.S. Attorney, assistant U.S. attorney. But then for nearly 15 years, Claudius was the first ever director of the Division of Enforcement at the PCAOB. Uh, Claudius, it's always great to see you. Welcome. Thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, I'm also very pleased to introduce Bridget Moore. Uh, our, um, she's a partner at Baker Botts, and she is also the co-chair of Baker Botts Litigation Department. Uh, Bridget was previously a staff attorney in the SEC's Division of Enforcement, and she is a, a true pro in the SEC enforcement space. Welcome, Bridget. Thank you. And finally, from the SEC, I'm delighted to welcome Carolyn Welshans. Uh, Carolyn is an associate director in the Division of Enforcement. She joined the SEC in 2007 and has a great combination of experience, having served in both the market abuse unit and the cyber unit. Uh, we're really interested in hearing from Carolyn and the SEC on this topic and really grateful that you're with us. Uh, welcome, Carolyn. Thanks, Bruce. All right. Thanks, uh, Steve. Let me turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. And so like all uh, good consultants, we always start out with, well, what's our objective? So the objective of the panel as we've gone through our prep sessions was really twofold. One, to very much make this focus on the topic at hand being financial reporting, disclosure, accounting, auditing, and the like. Two is to make it a dialogue. And so I think what we've tried to do is structure the panel to make sure that we're hearing government perspectives, practitioner perspectives, but at the end of the day, to be helpful to our audience members as, as we uh, move through the panel. So that's really where we try to focus the conversation, really getting at practice practitioner points. And so we're going to start off the panel talking about enforcement priorities. Uh, Chair Gensler, Director Ruhl have both put, put out remarks and speeches about different uh, priorities relative to financial reporting and gatekeeping. And, and uh, I think Carolyn is going to give us some, uh, some appreciation uh, around some of the finer points of those priorities. Carolyn? Thanks, Steve. Um, and, and just to start, I have to give the Disclaimer that everybody's heard with every panel, um, and that's that the views I expressed today are not necessarily those of the commission, uh, the commissioners or the commission staff. Uh, they are my own. Um, but but thank you for that. And and I mean I, I think it's it's no surprise um, the SEC and the Division of Enforcement have a number of priorities. Um, there's there's a lot um, out there for us to cover. But specifically with regard to financial reporting, financial disclosure, and accounting fraud. There are just a few that I thought I'd, I'd highlight today at a high level, and then I'm sure we'll drill down into some of those and related issues um, more during the, the panel. But the first is, is quite simply corporate responsibility. Um, we remain at, at heart a disclosure agency, um, and that the point is timely and accurate disclosures of material information to investors. Um, the, the second priority that I think of when I think about this particular space is uh, gatekeepers and individuals um, and the, the accountability um, there, particularly those in positions of enhanced responsibility um, when it comes to uh, financial disclosure and, and accounting. The, the third key area is, is crafting appropriate remedies. Um, there's, there's a lot of attention that's placed on our monetary remedies, disgorgement and penalties, and, and those are very important. Um, it's important to return ill-gotten gains it's important with penalties to have a deterrent and to send that message. But we also have a lot of other tools that, that come up in this space. A director and officer bars, 102E proceedings against accountants and lawyers, undertakings, um, including independent compliance consultants, et cetera. So there, there's a lot there that could potentially be on the table. Um, the fourth area that, that um, you've heard our director speak about is trusting and empowering SEC staff. And, and I've, I've very much appreciated Gerbier's remarks in this regard. 
we have fantastic staff. Um, they, they exercise their judgment on closing cases, on following the facts, wherever that might take them, um, discretion on uh, charging cases, on the, the recommendations we make to the commission. And I'm just so honored to work with them. Um, it's what's kept me at the SEC. And then uh, finally, um, you know, the, the last area I'd throw in in this space is, is our use of data, um, both to source some investigations and also to enhance those that, that, are, that we are investigating. Um, I think that's an, it's an exciting area and it, it really reflects the ingenuity of the SEC staff. So um, I'll stop there because I'm sure my fellow panelists have follow-up questions. Yeah, so why don't we pick up with uh, um, the gatekeeper accountability there. Claudius, you want to follow up on, on some of the comments that Carolyn's made? Yeah, so Carolyn, you know, uh, those of us who've been practicing for a while um, have watched um, the enforcement division focus on individual liability. Um, there's been a lot of consistency uh, in how that's been approached, but there's also been at times a different emphasis on individual accountability. And I think one thing, that when you, particularly when you look at some of these accounting fraud, financial reporting and disclosure cases, and you look at, at the fact patterns um, and you're in these investigations with the staff and you're engaging, whether your company counsel or representing an individual on that question of, of liability, the question is, yes, maybe negligence is, um, is adequate for like a causing charge, but what, where are the policy lines being drawn in this context of accounting fraud cases in terms of individual liability? I mean, I think, I think that the first response I would have to that is that the question of individual liability is very important. Um, you know, we, we take that very seriously, whether it, it's specifically gatekeepers or, or um, executives or others at, at public companies or at accounting firms. Um, what role did individuals play? What was the misconduct? What was the role of individuals? What did people know? Um, all of that, why, why did they act the way they did? Those are factual questions um, that are, shouldn't come as a surprise or very natural for us to, to want to ask. Um, but the facts take us where they take us. Um, and sometimes um, the facts do bear out that there is the enter on the part of individuals um, or individuals who do not follow um, for example, the, the, um, the standards of their profession. Um, but other times, it does lead us to, to negligence. It does lead us to causing. So it's hard to say that like, there's a, there, it's not a situation where there's a bright line, that there must be individuals in um, you know, all the cases, or that it must rise to a certain level. Um, it's us trying to figure out what happened and then exercise you know, our judgment on how that fits under the law if there is misconduct. Carolyn, what, um, from your perspective, when do you think in the course of an investigation, the staff would be, start to be willing to talk about those types of issues? Because I think, you know, we, we start to have to think about, you know, separate counsel versus can company counsel um, assist this individual through the investigation? So just wondering, you know, when, when that conversation can, can start um, occurring in earnest. I think it's a really good question, uh, Bridget, and it, it, you're going to hear me say this over and over today, and probably most of the panelists, that it, it does depend on the, the facts and circumstances of the individual case. Um, you know, I, I certainly welcome, I think my team's welcome, that sort of dialogue early. Obviously, the, the decision of representation and counsel is one for the client and one for counsel. We, we do not weigh in on that. Um, but um, we are very interested in the facts that you might know, um, you know, the, the documents you can point us to, the sooner you can do that, the sooner we can hone in on some of those issues and you can get a sense of the sorts of questions that we've got, the follow-up, the, the documents we're asking for, the testimony we're asking for, that I think, you know, can help point in that direction of where we might be going. Um, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, as I said, we're following the facts. Sometimes we might be able to earlier on, you know, be able to say, you know, we clearly are going to need to talk to the CEO, you know, look at these emails. And so, you know, that, that's a dialogue that, you know, I think the, the more you are open with us about why you're asking these questions, 
the more open we might be able to be back. Well, let's pivot a little bit around um, remedies. In one of the areas of priorities that's been identified by both the chair and the director around crafting appropriate remedies. What does that mean for things like admit or, uh, neither admit or deny? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, Gravier's um, speech um, uh, at SEC Speaks where he talked about admissions, I know has gotten attention. I, I know it came up on the first panel today, and I'm sure it's going to come up on the director's panel. Um, I don't know how new that is, though. Um, I, think, I think that what, you know, the, the division is, is doing here is reminding people that that's, that's a tool that we have in appropriate cases. We, we've brought admissions in the past. We may continue to do so going forward. Um, you know, the, the, the devil may be in the details as to which cases fall under those, those categories of where we think admissions are appropriate. Um, but I think you will see some of those going forward. Um, you'll also continue to see neither admit nor deny. Um, I think there's a recognition that not every case um, fits under the way that we're, we're thinking about admissions. Yeah. Well, let's pivot to one of the last points you mentioned there relative to priorities is around case identification and use of technology and data analytics. Mm -hmm. um, ha have any of those particular tools become more important um, and used by the staff for either purposes of, of the identification of the case or in conducting the investigation? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think just, um, and it's not necessarily unique to financial disclosure and accounting fraud cases. Um, there's, there's so much data out there. Um, you know, we, we all feel it, especially I think during COVID um, with how much more we're tied to our devices. Um, the, the explosion of the, of the internet of public information um, the, the data that companies use themselves, you know, to, to try to determine strategic decisions. Um, everybody's taking in a lot of data. Um, and I think that there is a way to be smart about how to use that data, including at the SEC. And so we've seen the use of data to source some cases. Um, I think the EPS initiative is a great example um, where the staff um, analyze reporting companies um, to identify anomalous uh, uh, patterns in the reporting of quarterly earnings per share, um, it is specifically looking at you know the potential for earnings management, um, and th that was you know I just think a fantastic example of a staff initiative. Um, we also saw it in the the Form 12B25 cases brought earlier this year, um, where the SEC charged eight companies for failure to disclose at the time they filed their Form uh, 12B25 saying that their um, filings would be late, that the, the reason what was causing that was because they anticipated a restatement or a correction um, of prior financial reporting. So those are examples of sourcing, um, but we use data a lot in the course of investigations, you know, looking across filings, um, trying to figure out how companies might fit within a particular sector and compare them to their peers. Uh, those are just some examples. Um, you know, others are, you know, sometimes when you get to the question of disgorgement, the, the methodology and how to calculate disgorgement can be very, very sophisticated and complex. Um, we've got great staff um, who are very adept at thinking about these issues in, in a really sophisticated way. Um, and so the use of data is very exciting. Well, let me pivot maybe to Bridget, you and Claudius, about um, when, when you're involved in cases that come up from a data analytic angle versus a restatement or um, other angles that we're used to dealing with, um, with with the commission, how do you approach that? What other considerations do you guys think about when advising client, when that's, that's how the case has been sourced and identified by the commission for investigation? From my perspective, Steve, what I see is that at the beginning of that type of investigation, we're working with people within the organization that we may not have worked with before, right? So we're bringing in those business people that are responsible for whatever metric um, the SEC is looking at. And, and ultimately, you know, they're helping us craft our, our response to the SEC. So I think that it's, it's just a, it's a broader team um, when that happens. And, you know, just another um, point with respect to this data analytics, you know, the, the, the EPS sweeps, you know, we've all had 
client in that. Um, but this idea of the use of data analytics, I think just generally um, the SEC has done a good job in, in getting that point across that, you know, that is, that is something that they focus on and use. And so our clients, you know, when they're putting together their disclosures, you know, are, are, are mindful of, of that fact. So, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's definitely a tool that's been used effectively, both, you know, in, in, in terms of preventative measures and then also in investigations. And I think, Steve, one of the challenges when you have um, something like the EPS initiative and a client may be caught up in, in that initiative is trying to get a sense as to whether other companies are similarly situated and get a sense from the defense bar, what are they seeing and hearing? You know, the initiative in this case has been going on since 2018, and we had a recent case that, that the commission brought on EPS, and um, it's still to be determined where, where will they take that initiative? How intense will it be? Um, is there uh, other nuances to the EPS initiative that we haven't seen before? And trying to get a sense as to whether this is something that's happening in a sector or industry basis, um, or is it more more focused on your particular client for, you know, for unique reasons. So that's part of the challenge in, in dealing with some of these initiatives. Got it. Um, Carolyn, is there, just as, as we sort of get ready to pivot off of priorities, is there anything else as um, our practitioners in the audience who spend a lot of time in front of you and your colleagues, any other advice you would give to them as they think about the new administration, the new director, the implementation of these additional priorities, um, you know, just as a practice point? Yeah, I, I, Edgar Beers talked about this. Um, Melissa, I heard her mention it on her panel this morning. Um, and that's specifically to practitioners. Um, you know, I think we are, we are looking for the dialogue, and, it, and I thought Melissa phrased it really well, um, talking about the, the there needs to be trust there that goes both ways. Um, and I think we're going to get into some of that, talking about some of the, the, the process of, of practicing before the SEC in this space. But um, you know, there are places where we are looking for help with efficiencies, um, looking for suggestions from counsel on the best way to ask for things, the best way to get the information we need. Um, we're going to be more open to taking those suggestions, though, if we feel we are dealing with honest brokers. Um, and so I think there is a lot of good that practitioners can do for their clients in terms of getting us all to where we want to go, which is you know, a, a determination of, of what happened um, sooner rather than later. Um, but that, that does require you know, work from the practitioner side as well, not just ours. Yeah, which is, is a great transition into the next topic we want to talk about, which is really the, the, uh, what we were hearing from um, enforcement leadership around this need for speed to, to accelerate the investigative process. Um, and I'd like to put the question out to you, Claudius, first, then Bridget, you, is as we're living in this rapid investigation um, a time period, and, and I'm sure every director says that that's, you know, everything's a priority, needs to be done quicker, but I think we're seeing some tangible evidence of trying to accelerate the investigation process. What are some of the considerations um, that you guys are trying to raise with your counsel around those points early in an investigation um, as the SEC's internal timeline has seemed to accelerate? So, Steve, it's a great point. And again, it's something, you know, with each new administration um, and new uh, leadership at the SEC, I, I think most chairs come in and they want to see things done more efficiently and at a better pace. It's better for the markets, it's better for the people caught up in these investigations, it's better for the staff. No one wants to work on an old case um, if you're the staff. And so, you know, part of the challenge and, and part of the engagement that you have to think about is talking to the staff early on about what their expectations are. What are they looking for out of the process? And it's not simply a matter of negotiating a document production or figuring out a testimony schedule, but trying to engage on the substance uh, wherever possible and figure out where their focus is and how, as Carolyn said, how do you help the staff get there in a way that's consistent with your client's goals and objectives and where's their alignment um, in that regard. And so it, there's always give and take on, on whether you can meet a particular document production deadline and, and whether certain people have to be 
you know, coming in, have to come in for testimony. But if you continue that dialogue along the way and you're helping the staff in an appropriate way connect the dots, and that's where I think counsel can make the difference is providing a narrative around some of these fact patterns, which can be very complex and cross over many, many years. And to do that um, without waiving privilege, and we'll, we can talk about that a little bit later, um, I think, I think uh, providing that type of narrative and connecting the dots is the most meaningful thing you can do, especially when the staff is focused on the pace of the investigation. Yeah, and I think for, for my part, it's been interesting. Um, and I'll just use two real life examples. You know, one investigation that's been going on for about, you know, a, a year now. And, you know, a lot of testimony has been taken um, through COVID uh, via WebEx, which was, was very effective. Um, and this idea that now we're seeing a shift in the urgency to, to conduct the remaining testimony. And for us, that's, that's fine. It's just managing the expectation of the client and making sure that they understand that there's just a shift in terms of how quickly things need to get done. Not that, you know, they, there, there is a specific, you know, emphasis on, on you client, um, that there's just a, a shift and educating them about that. And then the other um, real life situation is just working with, um, there's one, we have one investigation that came from OC to enforcement and enforcement is just very upfront. Like we need to get this done quickly. This is, you know, there it's essentially, you know, that there's their, they view it as, you know, policies aren't there. So violation. Um, so let's start, let's start talking about the end game, you know, sooner rather than later. We don't think we're gonna have to take testimony. It's just everything was kind of very upfront, which is helpful. And to your point, Claudius, and it was a very kind of upfront conversation. And again, it's just about managing the expectations of the client who may think that these investigations take a really long time um, and that the, the speed is now gonna increase. Maybe we get Carolyn in on this conversation. As both Claudius and Bridget have sort of um, both, you know, brought about the point of focus, both from a standpoint of uh, you know the productions and, and, and focusing those, as well as I think testimony. And Carolyn, you talked about trust and, and, and bridging that to uh, to drive this speed and having an honest broker relative to the internal investigation or, or counsel being an advocate for a client. How do those two things interplay? You know that in, that that focus. Um, that Claudius and Bridger were both talking about to try to drive a quicker process in building that trust in inter, um, uh, dealing with the commission staff. Um, so, I mean, I, I think it goes back to um, some of the points Claudius and, and Bridget were making, which is, um, you know, is it, is it an investigation where um, we're in the position where we can have that sort of discussion? Sometimes we're not. Um, so there are some investigations where just by the, the nature of the investigation or other factors, we're, we're not in the same position to be as transparent. Um, but where possible, I think asking for that dialogue, um, trying to get at what is the substance of what we really care about. Um, and, and an example I can think of is, you know, um, when it comes to documents specifically. Um, if we don't ask for something exactly technically the right way, but you know it's something we're going to want to see. You know that it's something that is of interest based on the rest of the, the questions we've been asking or the other documents we've been asking for. Consider providing that. That's a way to, to, to start to build that trust. It is also a way to help expedite the investigation because then I think the staff will be a little more comfortable in not having to ask for the kitchen sink and instead think about how to be targeted because they're gonna, we're going to have that comfort that by not asking for the kitchen sink, that doesn't mean we're gonna miss something that, that we really need to get and really need to understand. You still have the, the opportunity and the ability to come in and explain to us why you think it's not as bad as it looks um, and how it fits into the, the, the larger narrative. But that's one real life example I can think of um, where council have done that and I thought it's been very effective. Of it didn't, you didn't exactly ask for this, either it's outside of the time period or you know, it's, it's not technically how we read the, the subpoena item, but we know you're going to want to see it. Um, I think that that's a way to, to get that started uh, very effectively. Yeah, good. I was going to say one thing, Carolyn, that I think gets underutilized in some in or in the earlier stages. And again, it, the facts and circumstances are going to dictate the utility of this. Is but I've found attorney proffers to be very helpful. Um, 
uh, helpful in terms of providing a narrative, helpful in terms of previewing testimony and giving the staff an opportunity to hear um, at, at that, you know, at a certain level of detail, maybe not the same detail you get out of testimony, what a witness knows um, and, and which documents are, they're, they're familiar with and which part of the narrative they can contribute to and what roles of other persons they can address. And I found that helping the staff with that attorney proffer ahead of testimony or, or ahead of you know, any decision making they may make on, on a pre well stage or on, a, on the well stage can be very productive. And I think that gets underutilized. I think it gets more utilized with the criminal authorities, but I found that the staff is, is more amenable to it than it has been in the past. Yeah, I, I think attorney proffers um, can be a great tool. Um, I've also had teams who um, have started uh, testimony uh, specifically with, you know, someone that the, the company has helped identify who can give a good overview um, and then have used that to then help target our document requests and subsequent testimony to the extent we need it. So I think that, um, you know, th those efforts, again, they don't work in every case, um, but open to hearing those suggestions. I think we're you making those suggestions from the staff point of view. Um, you know, I think they're putting a lot of thought and effort into how to get to what's really at issue in the investigation and how to short circuit our understanding to get there, um, which I, I, I think has been very helpful. Yeah, I think building on that point too, and maybe I'll ask Bridget, you with your experience has been appreciating that the, uh, you know, the, the new director's only been there a short period of time, but have you noticed any difference as, as the uh, internal timelines for the SEC's investigation process have sped up relative to really how many bites the Apple Council gets at a chance of uh, providing their perspective on the facts from the standpoint of you know, uh, pre-wells, wells, white papers, you know, anything prior to an OIP? Yeah. I mean, my experience so far, and, and to your point, it's, it's kind of new, is that um, and to Carolyn's point, it's, it's really your relationship with the staff and are you being helpful um, and are you, are you hearing the staff in terms of, you know, what they need and, 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 and really at the end of the day, helping move along the investigation. So, um, you know, in my experience so far, it, it appears that we're able to, we're not being saying, okay, you can, you can do a pre-wells, but you can't do, you can't have a, a meeting after. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Because I think the, the relationship is, is one of cooperation and, and education kind of from both sides. And so it's been positive in terms of that because it really kind of is a two-way street. Um, but, you know, it, it'll be interesting to see um, how it evolves in terms of how many bites we'll get at the Apple. I think it's, for, from my perspective at least, it's kind of outside of my one um, experience right now. That's, that's been very positive. We'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, just on that point, Steve, um, you know, it really depends on the staff. You know, there's really not a uniform approach in terms of how to use the pre-wells, how to use the wells process. Um, it depends on, you know, it depends on the, on the engagement that we've been talking about that you've had with the staff from the very beginning of the case. And look, early on, you're, you're focused on, and, and the staff is focused on getting to the facts. And then you have this mix of, of factual presentation and advocacy and I have found that the pre-wells process evolves. You know, at first you start with a submission, you get feedback from the staff, you get follow-up questions. They may have you go in a direction you hadn't been going before. And it can, it can be a, a fairly drawn out process. And then the concern is if, if you don't, if the staff decides to pursue a case against your client, you know, what else can you do to round out your advocacy and make sure the staff is aware of, of all the relevant facts? And I haven't had to go to that compressed timeline of submitting a wells shortly after the pre-wells process is over. Um, thankfully, we, we resolve things at the pre-wells stage. But I think the tension there is if you have an extended pre-wells process, and if you're dealing with an accounting fraud case, you're dealing with some fairly sophisticated issues around accounting, um, disclosure over maybe multiple years with a lot of players involved and weighing in on a particular accounting determination. And it's not, it doesn't lend itself to a quick and dirty presentation and process. And so I think part of it is, again, just understanding the staff's expectations going into it about what they want to see happen in the process and, and being responsive to that, but also making clear to them, 
what you think is realistically doable under the circumstances, given, given all the pieces that you have to deal with. Yeah. yeah. And, and you talk a little bit about some of those things, Claudius. You know, the other side of that that we've heard from uh, commissioners from the new director is around how they think about precedent. Um, and so just maybe to, to you and Bridget, then Carolyn, just for you to respond um, after they go is how do you guys think about um, using precedent in, 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 uh, in discussions with staff around uh, remedial steps, charges? Um, you know, how, should, how, should our, how should council and practitioners be thinking about that? And in, in what have you seen be successful in, in those discussions with the commission staff? I'm happy to, to jump in here. You know, we, we take a very serious look before we're going into the staff um, about precedent. And, you know, I think that if you're able to look at what's come out before and distinguish yourself in, in a way that the staff is comfortable with and, and the way that, you know, won't get thrown in their face later to the extent that they settle um, use on different terms, I think has always been very helpful. Um, and it's, it's essentially, you know, that cooperation arming, arming the staff with, with points, again, that distinguish yourself. And so we, uh, we always make it a point to start, start with precedent. And, and candidly, you know, when, when our clients start, asks us, you know, can you ballpark liability? We always go to precedent, right? Because that's all you really have. Um, so whether it's, you know, the types of charges that have been brought or the, the penalties associated with it, um, that's, that's where we start. And, and we'll see as we go forward how, how precedent is used in, in settlements um, under this, this new um, director. But certainly for us, it's, it's someplace we always start. I mean, you have, to, you have to leverage the precedent. I have found that you rarely have an apples to apples situation where there's SEC precedent right on point. Usually you're cobbling together precedent um, and, and, and pulling from different cases um, how the staff resolved an issue on, on a remedy level. And really at the end of the day, it's the overall package of remedies that the staff is proposing and that, or that you're proposing that's going to um, you know, win the day and, and bring you to a resolution that makes sense. And then coupled with that, you're always looking at the strength of the staff's case. The stronger the case, the easier it is for the staff to make the point that this is a different case from precedent. You know, the, the facts we have here are stronger level of intent is more significant. And so you're really working on that level to try to use whatever advocacy you, you, you put in up to the point of settlement and leveraging that to make the case that you know, the violations, for example, it shouldn't be a 10B charge, it should be a 17A2 case, um, or you, know, you should not be imposing any type of bar, it should be a C and D and a penalty case instead. Um, and that's, that's really where I see a lot of the give and take occurring uh, with, with precedent in the mix, but it's pretty rare that precedent's gonna dictate where you end up. And, and I guess the only thing I would add to that, and I'd be interested in Carolyn's views is, you know, the message we're getting now out of enforcement is that um, it may be that prior cases have not brought the deterrent value that, that the commission has been looking for. And my question is, is how early in the process is the staff willing to engage in a matter to say, look, we're, we haven't made any judgments about what we're going to do in this case, but we want to let you know, this is an area of conduct that we think um, has not experienced the type of uh, deterrence that, that we want, expect, and need. Because I think that's going to help shape on a going forward basis in the case, how you think about you know, your engagement with the staff. So I, I, a couple of things, you know, I, I think um, I'd pick up one of the things Claudia said, and, and that's that I, I don't view precedent as the, the start or the end. Um, it's important, but it's, it's <clears throat> definitely not the only factor when thinking about, for example, charges or penalties or the length of bars. Um, for example, when, when, when thinking about penalties, the, the first question is, is a penalty appropriate? You know, assuming we're, we're at a, a, a case that is you know, either going to be resolved through settlement or, or um, in litigation. And that, that, that threshold question to me goes to things like, well, what is the misconduct? How egregious was it? What was the duration? Um, factors like that that go into whether a penalty is necessary here. And if the answer is yes, then you go to, well, that, what's the appropriate amount? And again, some of those same factors might play into that second question. 
and, and that's where I see precedent come in. Um, I, I do agree that it's very hard oftentimes to find something squarely on point. And so I think it is important um, to look at those facts. Um, it's not as simple as, well, here's the range of the penalties we've charged when it's been this charge. Um, you, you've, you've got to drill down um, and, and look at the facts. Um, has there, have there been developments in the law since that happened? Um, you know, what, what are the, 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 the cases that have come since then? There might be an earlier one that's more on point with facts, but what's happened in the development since then? Um, so I think those are all really relevant things to consider. Um, and then Claudius, uh, your point, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting, <laughs> you, you had a question. Yeah, so I, I think in light of uh, what um, enforcement has been saying about the need for deterrence, is I mm -hmm. think that throws precedent um, you know, up in the air a little bit in terms of even as a, a general measuring stick for where should you land on penalties, for example, and how soon in the investigative process will the staff indicate, we think this is an area that requires a stronger deterrent message. Because I think that really changes how you advocate and how you defend some of these cases if you know the staff feels like you're in that category. Yeah, and it, th that's, a, that's a little bit of a tough one to answer in a vacuum um, because it's gonna depend on the particular investigation and where it's going. You know, the, the staff approaches these with an open mind to try to figure out what happened. Um, you know, and so early on, we may not even know um, if we really think, you know, that there's a, an actual violation there and therefore be ready to think about how does this fit in terms of deterrence and, and precedent. But specifically when it, when it comes to penalties, because um, that's where I really think about deterrence, you know, there are a couple of, of, of relevant things to think about. Um, you know, the, the one is obviously individual recidivism. Is this, is this you know, a, 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 um, someone that we've seen before with this sort of misconduct. Um, there is also the, the general um, deterrence from penalties, the signal that it sends to the industry and to the market more broadly um, in terms of how we think about serial misbehavior in a particular space of the market. Um, and so, again, that's the one that it's going to potentially take time during the investigation to figure out how, how the facts are playing out with that particular company or that particular accountant, um, their particular facts, and how does that fit into what we've seen in the space before. Um, you know, I, I think that if, if you have thoughts of um, how you see those facts fitting in um, and why you think precedent is or is not relevant as a result, we're open to hearing that. I'm, I'm not saying we're necessarily going to be ready to have that dialogue at, at the time that you want to raise it, but I don't think it hurts to, to, to bring those ideas up so we can be thinking about it. Um, likely we're thinking about it too, but we're, we're, we're trying to still figure out the facts and how everything fits together. Yeah, so let's take that question around, uh, we're talking about speed, greater, greater, potentially greater significant penalties and how that aligns with precedent. Let's sort of take that same kind of conversation and talk about cooperation. Because you know, with an with a, um, accelerated invest investigation cycle, um, you know, how, how should, I'd like to start with Claudius and Bridget here, and Bridget, start with you, is you know, how should practitioners be thinking about when you have an accelerated cycle, appreciating that you know, you're trying to get cooperation credit with um, the SEC or DOJ or whoever it might be, some of the collateral risks, and how are you advising your clients around that, um, given things like concerns around privilege, the fact that your investigation won't be done and you're going to have to make decisions on an accelerated timeline. What are some of the points you think about as you're advising your clients that, in that situation? Yeah, I think um, for, from my point of view, it, it all goes to, um, you know, the, the, again, the, the level of cooperation, keeping the line of communication open with the staff, making sure that they understand that the client wants to cooperate, they're doing their best along this, this time frame. If you're having issues with privilege, to talk about them. I don't think I've ever been in a situation where the staff wasn't open to, to having that, that conversation. Um, and then again, you know, just, just trying to understand early what's left in the investigation. Do you, is there document production to be left? You know, if there is, um, can we work with the staff to, 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 to really focus that even more? Is there more testimony? Can we talk to the staff and see, you know, what their view of these individuals are? So if we need individual counsel, get them going 
quicker. So it's really, it depends in my mind, you know, level of cooperation, where you are in the investigation, and keeping that line of communication open in terms of, okay, what can we do here to get in front of you what you really need as quick as possible? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think um, if you look at the Kraft case and you look at the list there for the type of cooperation that the commission credited in the order, you know, it's the promptness, it's appropriately expanding the scope of your internal investigation without having the staff tell you, I need more from you, or I need you to go look at different issues. Um, you know, being timely in how you share that information and engage with the staff so they're getting it in a way that allows them to progress what they're doing and not create unnecessary delay, which is challenging, you know, for the client and for outside counsel and their forensic experts, you don't want to be conveying information that's not accurate. You wanna make sure you understand the facts before you convey them to the regulator. And so that's a balance of, of crossing your T's, dotting your I's on the facts, but also getting it um, over the transom uh, to the regulator so they can start putting it to use to decide whether there's something they need to follow up on. And then you have all the remedial steps. And, and part of the challenge there is knowing the issue well enough and it's well defined enough to know what remedial steps you need to take because it's one thing to say well we have an internal control problem around our disclosure process it's another thing to say well what in particular broke down here that needs to be remediated do people have to be replaced or do they have to do resources have to be added in order to make the process more robust and, and more productive and doing that before the staff tells you, oh, by the way, you, we think you need to remediate this problem. And so there's a timing issue, there's a scoping issue, but being proactive about that and engaging with the staff around those types of questions so that you, you have a, a, an evolving process that's responsive to the facts you're dealing with and, and it's timely and appropriate and it's value added. And that, that I think is what puts you in the best position, particularly in some of these accounting fraud and financial reporting cases to, to get the type of credit that, that, um, that you, you can get from the staff. And Steve, yeah. I, think, I think the tougher case than what Claudius had just um, articulated, which of course is tough getting all of that um, sorted out in a timely manner, it's the case where um, there's just a disagreement, right? That the company feels they did the right thing, the staff is used, used it differently, and, you know, Carolyn, what do you, what do you think of that in terms of cooperation and, and this idea of just a, a genuine disagreement as to the prop, proper disclosure or, or accounting treatment? And can those two things exist together? I, I think they can. I mean, again, another question that's a little hard to, to answer in a vacuum, but um, cooperation doesn't have to mean that advocacy is completely left, you know, at the door. Um, we understand that at the same time that, that you are facilitating cooperation from your client, it doesn't mean you are necessarily agreeing that everything that happened was terrible and, you know, the crime of the century. Um, so I think that there is still room to come in. For example, if it's a, if it's a complex accounting standard, um, I think there is room to come in and make that presentation um, of how you're viewing the applicable accounting standard. Um, at the same time, you know, you can also be, you know, producing the key documents, um, making the witnesses available for testimony. That is not what I consider cooperation. Um, I consider that not stonewalling and complying with your obligations under a subpoena. Um, but moving the investigation along, and there may be other ways to show cooperation even at the same time you're advocating. Um, are you helping us get to um, you know, if it's something very complex with a lot of data, is there a way to use that data to extrapolate um, to um, help explain to us the scope of something such that it cuts down on the need for testimony or a whole lot of documents? Um, are you helping facilitate, um, you know, with whether it's a narrative submission or something else um, to uh, explain the chronology, um, explain um, how the law fits in? There are different forms that cooperation can take, and it kind of may be dictated by that case. Some of it may go to remediation, um, you know, if you're enhancing existing controls and you can show that you've done that. Um, those are all different things that we might take into consideration, again, depending on the specific investigation. 
Um, but I think if there's that dialogue there that we've been talking about today, um, there is still the room to come in and, and make the arguments of, listen, like, we're getting you what you guys need. We're trying to get, you, get it to you as quickly and efficiently as possible and let you skip ahead. But at the same time, like, we want to have the room to argue that we don't think this is a violation and this is why. Well, excellent. I, now that Bruce is on the line, that is our cue to wrap this thing up. So I just want to say thank you, Carolyn, for the candid discussion and Bridget and Claudius for the fantastic input. Bruce, thank you for the opportunity to be involved. And, and I hope the audience got, got some good information out of it. It definitely did. Thank you, Steve, for uh, moderating a great panel. Uh, Bridget, Carolyn, Claudius, thank you so much for joining us. Um, our next panel starts at noon. Okay, so there's a bit of a break, uh, but we're coming back with two and more than two blockbuster panels. Uh, we'll have a director's panel at noon, has the new and uh, current SEC Enforcement Director, Gerbeer Graywall, uh, followed by remarks by the new SEC Chairman, Gary Gensler. So please be back here at noon. Uh, there's a lot of uh, great stuff coming up. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you.